So uh, he's best known for his study on the Piraha people and their language, uh, but he actually analyzed more than a dozen uh, uh, little or never previously studied Amazonian languages. Um, Daniel Everett has held appointments in Brazil at UNICAM, uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, USA, uh, Manchester, Illinois State University, the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, and Bentley University. And he has published on every major area of uh, linguistic theory, anthropology, and cognitive sciences, and published more than a dozen books, uh, both for the general public and professional audiences, uh, as well as a long list of articles in major journals. Uh, his, his 2008 uh, book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, Life and Language in the Amazonian Jungle, was translated in seven languages, becoming a bestseller in English, Japanese, Mandarin, Korean, and German. And the documentary about his life and work, The Grammar of Happiness, was released in 2012. So, Today, Dan will give a talk titled Dialogue and the Selection of Data for a Grammar. I would like to thank you once again, Dan, for accepting our invitation and for sharing with us your experience, uh, your data, and your thoughts on language. This online stage is yours. Thank you very much. It's really a tremendous honor to, um, for me to... Um, talk to you today. I, of course, would prefer to be in Italy with you. Um, but uh, since we can't do that right now, I'm, I'm still very happy to talk to you about um, uh, the title of this paper actually is the title of the first paper I ever gave in my professional career. It was at a conference in Brazil on philosophy of language. And um, I thought that uh, linguistic field research would have the greatest possibility of impact in theoretical studies if it began with dialogue. And actually the international conference that I spoke at was about dialogue. Um, but in all these years, 40 years later now, um, my feeling hasn't changed. Dialogue still seems to me to be central to what it is we're trying to do as field researchers. It's an honor for me to speak to you because you're interested in field work. And although I am interested in a lot of things, just as you are, I can't think of anything that is more important than doing linguistic field research. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about, how we do field research. This is obviously my personal perspective. There are many other perspectives. And as I look at the program for the conference, I see a number of wonderful papers by people that I respect very much who will be giving slightly different perspectives. But I would like to think that everything we're talking about is ultimately compatible. Um, so the first question is, uh, what is linguistic fieldwork? In the book that I wrote with Jeanette Sockle on linguistic fieldwork, uh, published by Cambridge, we define fieldwork as this the activity of a researcher systematically analyzing parts of a language, usually other than one's native language and usually within a community of speakers of that language. So if you are a native speaker of Italian, can you do field research on Italian? Well, yes, you can. It's just not the most common sort of uh, definition that comes to mind. Uh, all of my field work has been with um, endangered languages um, for the most part. I've done work in North America on Salish. I didn't actually do field work there, but I worked with Professor Sally Thomason, Sarah Gray Thomason um, on uh, Montana Salish. Um, then I've worked on uh, languages of Mexico, in particular, Sao Paulo, and uh, mainly in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, I've, I've spent time with, um, more than a dozen groups, as was mentioned, but I've spent nearly eight years working with the Pitaha. Um, and so that's one reason this definition resonates with me because it simply reflects my own experience. So why do we do field research? There are various reasons. I don't think any of them is, uh, 
is wrong. Um, you could do it as a salvage operation. Very often I get the impression from people who talk about endangered languages that we're trying to save those languages. Uh, maybe, I mean, we do have some interesting cases in history of language revitalization and language um, re loss reversal. Um, so that's one reason. It's never been my motivation, even though I've always studied endangered languages. Um, another is documentation, which is to um, is to provide. It's analysis is important for documentation, but it's sort of second secondary in a, in the sense that we're trying to produce a series of documents such as text files and dictionaries and uh, uh, other um, and grammars even um, that will um, uh, serve as a record for time to come. I think that's different from description, which in which analysis is the focus in which we want to give detailed descriptions. Uh, for, for example, Edward Sapir, who is probably my greatest linguistic hero, um, talked about linguistic description as being different from other components and very, um, very detailed analysis and understanding of the language. Uh, but we, we often see documentation and description used interchangeably. My interest in field work has always been more on the theoretical side. Um, you know, why, um, why do I want to do the theoretical research? Um, because I want to feel like I'm understanding more uh, about the nature of the species that I belong to. Um, and when we think about theoretical research, there are various approaches. Some people might want to start off with questionnaires or writing articles or doing a dictionary because they're interested in lexical theory or grammars because they're interested in grammatical characteristics of human languages. These are all good reasons for doing fieldwork. Uh, we know when we do fieldwork that it's going to take a large part of our lives, that we're going to get sick, that we're going to undergo all sorts of hardships. Um, you know, I've had malaria many times and typhoid fever and um, all sorts of dysentery. And, and you have to ask yourself at the end, is it worth it? And the answer for me is a resounding yes. So I'm going to cite a problem that uh, Chomsky posed uh, over 40 years ago, which is the demarcation of relevant facts. We have little a priori insight into the demarcation of relevant facts, that is, into the question of which phenomena bear specifically on the structure of the language faculty. Um, I actually don't believe in a language faculty, but if, you, but I am interested in what phenomena. Uh, bear on the theoretical questions that I have in mind in its initial or mature state to produce the data directly presented to the investigator. So you're going to be, when you go off to the field, you are bombarded with information. What do you spend your time looking at? What are the relevant facts that you want to talk to people about that you want to make a record of? So I looked at, um, I was faced with a situation in Pitaha that uh, that I wrote about in my master's thesis in actually 1979. Um, and, and, and it was a problem for me at the time. So there are two rare sounds in Pitaha. There's a voiced bilabial vibrant, and there is a unique sound uh, that's a double lateral flap, where the tongue actually comes out of the mouth. And according to earlier phonemic studies of Pitaha by missionaries who preceded me, these two segments are in a type of free variation with the phonemes B and G. So B goes to uh, B or brr between O and I and B elsewhere. So if I have the word lake, I can pronounce it a ah, boy or a ah, broy. Um, and then there is the G goes to G or this flap L. That's very weird. There's a historical reason for that. But anyway, you have this other rule which is, uh, so take the word milk, it's iboge, or ibroge, or ibrole, or ibole, or you can also say, uh, which is tonal. So this is a weird state of affairs. So you could just describe it as a form of free variation, but if you look more closely, in fact, I wrote a more technical generative phonological rule. I haven't looked at this rule now for about 43 years, but um, this rule seems to capture what's going on, but I don't feel like it 
really captures the situation as it is. So, so as I began to talk to people and listen to conversations, I would hear the I would hear these sounds in different uh, circumstances. So for uh, a female, um, they will produce these sounds whether Portuguese people are around or not. Super straight means Portuguese in my analysis at the time, and minus super straight equals Pita Ha. But uh, so females don't, or at least didn't back those years ago, talk directly to outsiders. So they use this sound um, frequently um, or not. I mean, it's in, otherwise in free variation. Uh, I won't go into the details of what, of other components of it. Minus female. Um, so in a familiar situation where there are Peter Ha talking to Peter Ha, Peter Ha, they might use either one of the sounds. But in a non-familiar situation, which is they're just talking to Brazilians, uh, even if they're talking in Pitaha, they will only say uh, the G and the um, B sounds because those are found in Portuguese. Uh, and the reason for this is that Brazilians make fun of them or used to when they would use these sounds. Um, but I was only able to discover this through the study of dialogue and looking at how they converse um, and so that was very, that was very important to me. So when we think about the act of data selection, we're always acting to do this. We're, we're always performing an act of editing. What do we include and what do we leave out of our study or our reports on our studies? So imagine that you're a photographer or a videographer and you're trying to do visual anthropology or simply document sounds. And so, for example, when Peter Ladefogen and I went to the um, Pinaha and we went to the Wadi, where I've written another grammar, and to the Oroin, uh, uh, which is a language I discovered uh, in Brazil, uh, they had unusual sounds. And so we, uh, we you know, coated the inside of their mouth with, uh, um, with a chemical that, you know, a dye that Peter brought from the US and we got them to make the sounds and we took photographs of the inside of their mouth and saw exactly how they articulated the sounds. But we didn't take pictures of all the sounds they made. We didn't take pictures of the scenery. Uh, we simply took pictures of particular sounds and how they were produced. Um, if I'm trying to record the culture, I'm going to point my camera at things I consider to be important and omit other things, which means there's always a possibility of mistake. Uh, and there will always be mistakes, but that's just um, part of the job of collecting data. Um, as a phonetician, what do you record? Um, uh, Peter Latterfog had felt that um, paradoxically, you should do the phonology before you do the detailed phonetics. Most people would think the other way around, but his view was that until you understand the phonology, you really aren't sure what you're trying to do in the phonetics. So we can't record everything. Um, we can test, we can do full records, but these are unlikely. We don't have time to record everything. We, we're going to do what it is that we're most interested in doing. So we might as well admit that um, when we go there. I think that the grammatical hierarchy as introduced by the North American linguist Kenneth Pike about 50 years ago or longer uh, is a very important um, type of information to keep in mind. There are conversations which include discourses. Discourses include paragraphs. Paragraphs include sentence clusters. Sentence clusters are made up of sentences which are made up of clauses, which are made up of phrases, which are made up of words which are made up of morphemes. We don't study morphemes in isolation. We look at how they're distributed in words. We don't study words in isolation as much as we look at how they're distributed in phrases. My argument is that this is true of everything in the hierarchy. We don't study sentences unless we look at how they're used in paragraphs, discourses, and conversations. The first person that I'm aware of who pointed out the importance of paragraphs and discourses in field research was um, James Laureate, an SIL a missionary who published uh, um, over 50 years ago, an article on paragraphs in Shipibo, uh, an indigenous language of uh, Peru. Um, and that article was uh, 
foundational in getting people to think of elements higher than the sentence. Um, I've never written about Peter Ha paragraph marking, but I do believe that intonation can be used to mark paragraphs in Peter Ha. The other thing about doing field research is you can't possibly write up and analyze every single thing you observe. You only have one lifetime. Um, I also think that for data selection, semiotics uh, are important. This is not something that linguists tend to talk about so much, at least in North America, but I think it's absolutely uh, vital. All of the units of the grammatical hierarchy from the conversation to the morpheme are uh, symbols in the sense of Charles Sanders' purse. And so when we think about looking at signs, even if we don't want to write a paper on semiotics, it's a good intellectual exercise. We can think about signs from the perspective of the object. So an index is a sign linked physically to the object like smoke and fire. An icon is something uh, which corresponds to the object such as a photograph or a diagram of a sentence. A symbol is uh, by and large a conventional uh, sign that is uh, used by a society um, it can also be a concept. If you think concepts are innate, like Immanuel Kant, um, Elizabeth Spelke, uh, Noam Chomsky, Jerry Fodor, then these are also uh, non-conventional symbols. If you believe, like I do, that concepts are all learned, um, then all symbols are uh, conventional. So understanding what's conventional is important to the, to the linguist. I won't go into all of these signs uh, but I do want to have them here and um, uh, because they're all important to field research ultimately, but this isn't a paper about semiotics and field research. But I do want to emphasize that the most important thing, it seems to me, for the field worker is how people interpret the world around them. How do they interpret their sentences? How do they interpret nature? How do they interpret uh, what they mean when they talk to one another? And this is uh, perhaps the greatest uh, contribution of Peirce to the understanding of, of uh, communication and language is to look at the role of interpretants and how we uh, interpret uh, signs. Um, and, and the book that I'm currently working on is called Persian Linguistics, in which I try to develop this, these ideas more. So is there such a thing as objective data collection and field work, you know, so that no, none of my biases are, um, are present, that I'm just objectively collecting data? Well, I don't think so. I think that all data collection is driven by our own values um, and our own, our own desires to understand things. I've written a separate paper on this called Coherent Field Research, um, from, and, and I'm happy to to ask answer questions about that or or but but by and large we want a theory to inform us uh, so data collection should be biased by the theory of the field worker we shouldn't try the naive idea of collecting unbiased data our data will be biased and we might as well make the most of it as kenneth pike said a theory is a window on the world of course windows can be too small they can be giving us the wrong view but we can't see through a wall. So theories are important to get glimpses of what we're trying to do. And I have always found when I do field research that constant reading is necessary. Even when I would walk for hours at a time through the jungle, <clears throat> I always had books in my backpack <clears throat> uh, to read because this kind of reading is vital for uh, the field research that you're trying to do. Not reading just in one theory, but reading ideas from all over um, so that you can think of new possibilities. The language will be your teacher and you just need to have some ideas on how to interpret it. So when we record conversations, so which to me is the place to start is with conversations. And I should say that Again, that most, most of what I'm talking about here is biased by my own experience, which is largely monolingual. Um, I have worked in situations where the uh, speakers spoke another language that I spoke, such as with the Banawa who speak Portuguese as well as Banawa. But most of my uh, field research life has been with the Piraha, 
who don't speak Portuguese and where I had to learn their language before I could ask them about their language um, and, and to move on to conversations. Um, so how do you record conversations? Well, first you have to know about the place. Where are you gonna record this? Um, is it gonna be, if, if the place is too private so that you get high quality sound, you might make your language teacher very uncomfortable. They might prefer to be surrounded by friends. And we'll, I'm gonna show some film examples of this in a bit. Uh, what topics do you want to uh, uh, record? What, what things are interesting to you? I would always suggest topics that, are, that reveal something about the culture. Get, if you can get the people to talk about um, their values or hunting or fishing or how they do things, um, this is gonna be more important overall, both linguistically and culturally, um, than simply getting someone uh, to describe two people to talk about a bird that just flew by the window. That can also be important, it's all important, but try to think about topics that are going more likely to reveal deeper knowledge. Which teachers do you work with? Um, I often find, it doesn't always work, but one question I try to ask is, who tells the best stories here? Who, who can talk the best? Um, who do you like to listen to? Those kinds of questions, because fluent speakers like that, natural storytellers are going to be uh, one of your best sources of information. What court of, sort of equipment do you take? Well, you know, if you were Edward Sapir, your equipment was a pe uh, pencil and paper, uh, so it wasn't much of a choice. If you were me at the beginning of my career back in the 70s, um, you may, might have a a cassette tape recorder, um, but uh, by and large, I would walk in the jungle with people and just take notes using pen and paper. Um, uh, and eventually the people, you know, the, I would ask a question while we were walking and the men might say, did you bring your pencil and paper? No, oh, then we're not gonna bother with it right now because you'll forget and ask us again later. Um, so be sure to be armed with your equipment, even if it's just pencil and paper. Uh, I also find it useful after I've recorded a conversation to have people talk about the conversation, get a conversation about the conversation. And then occasionally I get conversations about the conversation about the conversation. So it's um, uh, using topics to get people to, you know, so what did they say? What were they talking about? And you find that even in a group that doesn't write their language, like the Pita Ha, huh? once they start talking about conversations that they're hearing that you've already recorded, they start to make corrections. They say, oh, he said this, but he didn't actually shouldn't have said that. He should have said this. Well, that might be right and that might be wrong, but it's certainly giving you two speakers perspectives on what is being said. So getting people to reflect metalinguistically is one of the functions. So I usually have uh, three or four tape recorders with me in the village, one to record the original conversation, um, you know, a couple as backup, uh, but also I'll be playing one conversation while I'm recording a conversation about that conversation. So, so you need to have more equipment than you might otherwise think. How do you record people? Well, one way to do it that I've seen others do is to surreptitiously record people. You know, they don't know they're being recorded. You can ask them later for permission, but I find that ethically questionable. I, I don't feel comfortable doing that, that people will start to distrust you. Uh, you know, if, if somebody came to you and told you, oh, by the way, I've been recording all your conversations in your house for a week. Is it okay if I use them in my paper? Um, that might make you somewhat irritated. So I don't do that. Uh, another idea is to stage the conversation. Well, you can do that. If you have good language teachers, um, they might be actually able to get up a conversation that's somewhat natural. But I also find this is very difficult and it's uh, very hard among the Pita Ha to get a natural conversation that I've tried to stage. Other groups do it more easily. Um, you can also get people talking about something that serves as a stimulus, such as playing uh, one person talking and then getting two people to converse about that person you recorded. Um, so, um, there are various ideas. Uh, they won't all work. Uh, some of them will work better than others. And it's a matter of constant creativity. But the key, it seems to me, is to get natural discussion going between speakers, forgetting that the linguist 
is present. If they're focused on you or they're worried about pleasing you, the conversation will be that much less natural. So here's just a small sample uh, from the Banawa with two speakers, Batan and Bidu. Um, and uh, this is a 45 minute conversation. I've obviously only got the first couple of lines. And the way I recorded this was with a stereo recorder, which uh, they each had headphones with microphone and they were each recording into separate channels. So when I transcribe this, um, I can hear each speaker separately very clearly. And uh, this was actually then worked into a master's dissertation by a student of mine at the University of Manchester who actually went with me to the Banawa. So, uh, you know, the first speaker says, Bidu, let us talk today. Let us talk in our language. You see, all Bidu is saying, B there is, mm, eh, mm. He's just, eventually he takes off and he's putting discourses in the conversation and it really gets going, but it starts off slowly. Um, and, and it starts off Daniel, which is me and the others all came together. They like our language very much. So um, um, it, it turned out, it started off artificially, but if you leave the tape recorder uh, rolling and you don't say anything and you just smile like uh, you guys are great, uh, they'll probably keep talking and eventually this will work into something. Actually, when I've done work on, uh, you know, Pinaha recursion, which, um, you know, I published a lot on in the last years, and hopefully I won't be publishing any more about it, but uh, um, if my noticing of this began with conversations, with translations, and with discussions of recorded text. So um, when, when I did my initial analysis of Pinaha, I, um, I could hear two sentences next to each other and think that they were uh, one was embedded in the other, because in English, for example, it would have been. But as I talked to people and got them talking about other people talking, um, they seemed to stumble on my, my particular interpretation of some sentences. I went to the mission, I went to uh, the Pitaha originally as a missionary. I'm an atheist now and have been for many years, but I went as a missionary and I translated the gospel of Mark into Pitaha and nobody understood a word of it. And this was very puzzling to me because I knew the words were right. And um, I could actually get people to repeat after me, but they were making breaks uh, between sentences that I wasn't expecting. And they would tell me that something doesn't work. And so then they would discuss this and they would always break down the sentences I had constructed that involved um, my version of recursion. Um, and they would break them down into non-recursive uh, utterances, uh, non-recursive sentences. And, and this got me thinking about the nature of, of grammar. And I would never have discovered this if I hadn't engaged in conversation and recorded conversations, if I hadn't attempted translation. Uh, translation is a wonderful way to test your linguistic analysis. Um, you know, when, when you think you've understood something, try to translate it. Um, but here's an example of why that can break down. I, I would ask a Pitaha man, for example, can you say this in your language? And I would give him an example. And he might reply, yeah, sure, you can say that. And I would say, well, repeat it back to me. No, why won't you repeat it? Because we don't talk like that. But you said it was okay. Yeah, sure, you can say whatever you want. You're not a Pitaha. Um, so they were, they were allowing me to say things that they would never say themselves. So that's, as you discuss these things with them, you want to be sure that you're trying to get them to, re, to say what you think is grammatical. And if they won't say it, um, which most thoughtful, teachers won't if it's ungrammatical, then, then you're on to something. Uh, so when we were looking for recursion, we did a series of experiments. And when I say we, um, the woman in this slide is Eugenie Stoppert, who's a linguist in the Netherlands. The arm there is mine. Uh, also seated in this room are Mike Frank, who is a philo uh, psychologist at Stanford University, and Ted Gibson, who's a cognitive scientist at um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So what we're trying to do is to create stories 
and asked the uh, Pinaha speaker sitting in front of us, uh, the fellow here with the Brazil t-shirt, to, um, to tell us what we've said in such a way that it would be natural to use recursion. <laughs> So first I said, uh, this little guy here uh, killed a jaguar. And then I go to the other one and I say, this little guy here killed a bird. Uh, and he would repeat after me. And so I said, and this guy, who is the guy who killed the jaguar, uh, fell down. So I tried to get him to say, you know, so, so I would ask, who fell down? And the hope was that he would say, the man who shot the jaguar fell down, uh, then that would be evidence for embedding. But um, he never said anything like that. In fact, all the speakers, um, many videos of speakers in a situation like this, uh, no one used anything approaching uh, recursive or embedded clause. That doesn't prove anything, which is one reason we've never used these experiments in our publications. But it does show uh, how we try to collect the data in conversation and how particular constructions never rose in conversation. Here's another one with a Pitaha woman, just to give an idea. That's first hand. Yeah, right yeah. Yeah. Say hello? I, uh, so the first thing we're doing is getting names. We sit down. Now notice how unnatural this circumstance is for this woman. Pinaha women, as I said earlier, don't normally speak to outsiders, but because I speak the language and because she's known me since she was a little girl, um, one of the advantages of growing old in the field situation, um, she trusts me. But even so, we allowed her, you know, her children in this little hut in which we were doing the uh, questioning. This is in just outside the village with about, you know, 50 yards, a 50 meter walk. Um, and uh, her dog was in there too, actually. Uh, so she felt fairly comfortable. So here I go with my little stick, my little fingers again. So that's sort of distracting, but it's actually good because it, you see the smile on her face. She's not nervous at all. She's quite uh, enjoying this because we have allowed it, we have designed it to be as natural as possible with four, you know, white people, uh, uh, who, who, three of whom don't speak the language looking on. No way. So here we're just doing the same experiment and the fact that she repeats after me is a good sign. Uh, we weren't able to find any evidence of uh, recursion or recursive structures in these experiments, but, um, but it's based on conversation. So the conversation can be between the two native speakers or you and them. Uh, which brings up the issue of learning the language. And I have argued in many publications that um, to me, um, what I find most effective is the first step in field work is to learn to speak the language. I don't believe that um, a, a deep understanding of the language can come about if the linguist doesn't speak the language. Uh, many people disagree with me, so I'm not telling you that's the right way to do things. I'm saying that's what works for me and what I think is important. Um, the other thing is culture and language. How do uh, those two fit together? Uh, they seem to fit together in conversation. Um, so I can give just a couple of uh, uh, ideas and concepts from my own work on culture and the relationship to um, language from my book, Dark Matter of the Mind, the Culturally Articulated Unconscious. So dark matter of the mind is knowledge how and knowledge that. It's all the things we know that we don't tend to talk about. Some of them we can't talk about. So you can tell somebody how to write a book, 
but you can't tell them how to write a good book. That that depends on, you know, that's not knowledge that, that's knowledge how. So not all the things we can do are uh, effable. Like many things we know are ineffable. They can't be spoken. Um, and culture is an abstract network of overlapping, overlapping dark matter. So culture is an abstract network shaping and connecting social roles, hierarchically structured knowledge domains and ranked values. It always changes. So uh, to give an example of hierarchically uh, structured knowledge domains, color is one term, red, blue, and green, et cetera, are subterms of this hierarchically structured color domain. Um, if I, if two societies value wealth, honesty, love, and independence, they will nevertheless turn out very different depending on whether wealth is the most important or independence is the most important or honesty is the most important and so on. Uh, you can also say that um, uh, one group of people, um, two groups of people, let's say we're comparing Houston with um, Houston, Texas with uh, with Paris, France, or, uh, you know, Bologna, Italy. Um, Houston, Texas is known to have the greatest examples of obesity in the United States, um, or it was. Um, so you can say that in Houston, they value good food and they value being in shape. In France, they value good food and they value being in shape, the same thing in Italy. But if you value being in shape more than you value good food, um, that's going to lead to very different phenotypes. So these different uh, cultural rankings lead to very different kinds of societies, even though the values are the same. Each syntactic operation that we record is a type of sign. Um, construction grammars, role and reference grammar templates, uh, minimalist merge, it's just a specific hypothesis on how signs are combined. All different theories are, whether they recognize it or not, about semiotics, about the nature of the sign, the inventory, interpretation, and arrangement of signs. And there are various theories on how we do this. Um, one is that cognition controls grammar. That's basically Chomsky's universal grammar. Another theory is that grammar controls cognition. That is linguistic relativity. Benjamin Lee Worf's idea drawn from Edward Sapir. Uh, cognition controlling culture is a, a, a manifestation of the hypothesis of Brent Berlin and Paul Kay that color terms are universal. Um, grammar controlling culture, well, the anthropologist Greg Irvin from the University of Pennsylvania has argued that uh, we can determine a lot about cultures based on the way they converse and the types of discourse they have. Um, culture determining cognition, uh, long-term effects of thinking on cultural restrictions on certain behaviors. So the Pita Ha don't do mathematics because they have no words, not even the number one for numerals. Um, there's a, a place where the culture has had an effect on cognition. Culture can also affect grammar, um, ethnogrammar, uh, ethnophonology, individual forms structured by culture. We, everybody agrees that we have certain words in our vocabulary that are determined by our culture. So for example, um, if you go to Edinburgh, go to a pub, you can order haggis. Most places in the world don't have haggis and they don't have the word haggis unless they borrowed it from uh, Scotland. Uh, that's because it is a term that is relevant locally. Uh, the idea here, though, is that culture can affect grammar in many more profound ways. And these can only be shown through living with the people and conversing with the people and observing the people. Um, one of the first people to point out the importance of uh, discourses and conversations on sentence structure was Zelig Harris, who was, as we all know, the person who invented the concept of transformation, and, which was taken over by his PhD student, Noam Chomsky. So for Harris, if we have an active to, and a passive, Bill, John saw Bill, Bill was seen by John, uh, he called this relationship, he didn't believe in a deep structure or surface structure, he just said, these two sentences are related and we'll call that relationship a transformation. Um, 
And so you use John saw Bill if John's the topic and you use Bill was seen by John if Bill's the topic. Uh, so discourse selects the sentence structure. This was obvious to Harris and he gave a methodology to go from discourse down to morphemes. Um, the only thing he omitted was conversations, but discourses are constituents of conversation. How are heroes represented? Um, if, if you have a culture which is primarily um, uses uh, passive sentences, which there are certain languages, uh, Urban has argued for such languages, um, then the heroes are people who are always having things done to them as opposed to doing things, which if they're, sta if they're stated actively. Um, so these are ways in which conversation and, dis and, and uh, sentence level syntax can actually affect culture. Who are the active subjects? Who are the passive subjects or the er absolute, absolutive ergative subjects? What are the functions of the different grammatical operations for interpreting signs? So we look at conversation, we have a number of uh, questions. What do they converse about? Where do they converse? When do they converse? What do they converse about the most? How does prosody mark different topics, power relationships, age relations? How does segmental phonology mark social groups or values? Sapir noticed in New Chatnal, uh, which at the time was called Nutka, um, that, um, that people use different consonants for the same word uh, so you might refer to that man, but you would use one consonant if he's short, another consonant if he's tall, another consonant if he's fat, another consonant if he's skinny. Um, so um, you actually make cultural value judgments based on the segmental phonology that you insert into the words. And these um, you will find through conversation. Uh, if you're simply eliciting words, you might get all of these and not have a clue about what they, what they do. Also, um, in conversation, gestures arise more naturally, and gestures are crucial to understanding uh, syntactic breaks, grammatical structures. How is syntax implicated? You know, so taking Zelig Harris's remarks again, when do the people use passives? When do they use actives? How do these relate to the way they tell stories? What does this tell us about verb structures? In some languages, such as most languages of the Americas, in my experience, by far the most complicated part of the language is the verb structure. So Pinaha has very simple syntax, but every verb has uh, at least two to the 65th power, you know, has, has uh, well over uh, 65,000, two to the 16th power. Every verb has over 65,000 possible forms. You know, so if you think about Spanish or Italian or other Romance languages, when you think about a verb, you're thinking 30 to, uh, to maybe 50 at the outside forms for a verb, but in Pinaha they have 65,000. Um, and how do we discover, you can't ask people what the difference is. I might ask a Pinaha man what a verb means when it's got seven suffixes on it, and he will tell me, and then I'll ask him what the same verb means when it has one suffix on it, and he might say, oh, just the same, just the same. But you, we know it's not the same. Um, you would give the same reaction maybe if somebody were asking you about Italian verbs. We don't always think about these things, but they do emerge in conversation. Uh, there are various models of conversational analysis, Garfinkel's ethnomethodology, Sachs and Shegloff's work on it. There are the typical things people look for, turn-taking, topic shifting, and so on. My, my reason for emphasizing dialogue and conversation is not necessarily to come up with an analysis of conversation per se, but sentences and prosody and question words and verb structure, all the things that are the, um, the core values of lingu linguists. Um, also in conversation, you find different channels of discourse. So in Pitaha, these can tell us a lot. Hum speech in Pitaha is used for disguise, privacy, intimacy, talk when the mouth is full, child language acquisition. Yell speech is used for long distance, musical speech, whistle speech. And I have examples of all of these that I wanna show you, but these only emerge in, in conversations and observing natural conversations. And they show different forms of verbs, different structures of sen sentences. All of these things are vital if we're gonna figure out the language. Um, if you're working with the Pitaha, you're probably sitting here on the sand or you've got a boat that you're in or you put up a tent um, or hammocks. I usually uh, very often stay in hammocks. 
the sun is hot, the Amazon is always hot, uh, not as hot as California where I'm from, but it, it can get hot. Um, and so you wanna ask them questions. So this is my typical uh, setup when I'm in the village, hammocks in the jungle, a guitar for uh, uh, the evenings. And, uh, and you might hear people conversing uh, like this. So that sounded uh, uh, loud. I mean, he was actually yelling across the river to other people. And, and, uh, um, and so that was just one segment of a conversation. And it gives me something to go on for analyzing the intonation and the sentence structure. Here's an example of hum speech in the language. It's quite common to see caregivers converse with children just by humming or people who want privacy just by humming. Um, and you get different um, uh, you, you get different perspectives on the prosody when they hum, when they whistle, when they use these other channels, they respect the stress structure, they respect the syllable length, they respect the tones. And so as you listen to them converse in these different ways, you get fresh information on all of these things. Here's an example of whistles. So in the whistle speech, which tends to be used mainly by men, which is also the, an important fact, you get, again, different perspectives. They have tonal perturbation rules, which do not seem to... Um, operate in whistle speech. So if you have if you have the hypothesis that this midtone is really a low tone, then by listening to whistle speech, they probably are going to whistle a low tone there because they don't whistle midtones. Uh, if they whistle a high tone instead of the midtone you were expecting or the low tone you were expecting, your analysis is off, but you can't figure that out without going into these different channels of discourse. Uh, intonation is very interesting. Sometimes the intonation goes up. Other times the intonation um, tends to drop at the ends of sentences and you get this through conversation. Um, and then also in singing, um, when you can figure out what they're singing about, um, the singing is actually just the tones of the words separated even more and the rhythm slightly altered. Uh, other than that, it's just talking. It's, so I call it musical speech, but uh, we could also call it uh, music. Um, there's no reason we couldn't call it music, but I, I prefer to call it musical speech. Here's an example of them doing this in unison. And the reason they sing in unison is because they know this. So here's something that's been codified. This is like a story, but it's instead it's a song. So figuring that out tells you something. They also sing loud, uh, but um, that that was uh, somewhat in unison. Uh, this is one where men are singing, and it seems to be mainly um, following. So they're singing about something that is, um, you know, a common daily occurrence. But this is not a memorized song. So therefore, one guy is like a syllable or two behind the other guy. And the mistakes he makes are important for figuring out uh, different components of the grammar. Here's another one where a fast mouth, kawaii boke, is speaking. Um, it's a type of spirit, uh, but mainly just a, we can call it a, a different jungle entity that looks like a human. It's actually a human, but you can, you can hear the difference in, this, in the register. This is a man interpreting a woman who has been dead, and he's trying to tell us what it's like to be dead. 
Um, and so while he's doing this, people are sitting around and they're talking to him. That conversation didn't show in that little sample, but um, um, uh, you, you can't find these things out also because I only do some of these behaviors at certain times of the year. So you, if you're not staying there through all four seasons or three seasons, whatever the number of seasons they have um, for the Peter Hans rain, it's low water and high water, um, then you're gonna miss some of this stuff. Now here's some whistle uh, speech. <laughs> um, after all these years working at the Pita High, I still don't know what that means. Um, it's something that men do when they're out hunting or it's funny. Um, they play tag sometimes and sing that. So it's like a, like a war song, a vestige of a war song or hunting song, uh, but all whistle and women don't partake in that. Um, but it does give you ideas about um, prosodic groupings. Uh, the others give you ideas about syntactic groupings as well. And finally, uh, there's a form of theater and conversation about that. And these are very important to understanding um, uh, more about both the culture and the language. Okay, August 1st. You hear the night sounds, it's pitch black when we're doing this. Um, I, whoops, I, I want to show you that. So that again is the guy telling us what it's like to be a dead woman. It's a sort of... Uh, interesting thing, but he will deny that he was ever there. He will say that it was the woman and he missed it because he wasn't there. It's a very interesting cultural phenomenon. But what I noticed is that when the people speak normally, they have, um, they have ternary branching, uh, ternary groupings of syllables. They have trisyllabic feet uh, in the prosody. But when he's talking like that, um, and, and especially when he starts singing in that voice, he tends to have bisyllabic prosody. So you see the very prosody shift in ways that you wouldn't unless you explored in these ways. So um, my, my simple advice is to begin at the top of the grammatical hierarchy and see how each unit as mes is manifested at different levels. Examine carefully the semiotics of all speech and cultural events, how do conversations affect the structuring of the lower units, and be able to converse well in the language under study. Um, if you're paying attention, you realize that this can't be done in six months. So this is an idealistic form of field work. One of the advantages of originally going as a missionary was that I could stay as long as I wanted. So I've lived in the village for close to eight years. And so I had time to do a lot of stuff that you wouldn't have time for if you were just going to do a, a PhD dissertation. But I would say, you know, I think that the average anthropologist, when they go off to study a culture that hasn't been studied before, figures on spending two years with the group um, for a linguistic dissertation, which I consider to be even more difficult, um, you know, that you could have an ideal of that. Not everybody can do what they would like to do. We can't always live up to our ideals. I mean, six months, if, you have, if you've only got six months, that's a lot better than nothing. So by all means, take it and do the best you can with that. Um, but again, there's nothing more exciting to me than doing field research and figuring these things out. And when I'm trying to understand the language and find it very difficult, I always look at um, um, the Pinaha children who are three and four, and I say, well, they speak it already better than I probably ever will speak it. But if a three-year-old can learn to speak it, I'm going to do my best to learn to speak it uh, myself. So. Um, I will now see if, if there are questions about this. Um, and I touched on, on many topics, but the, the key idea is that the conversation is the key to the sentence and other components of the grammar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for your rich uh, and insightful presentation. Thank you. I can see hands clapping in the Zoom way. <laughs> which helps. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I'm sure 
there will be questions and comments uh, because you addressed so many different aspects of, of field work on the one hand, of linguistic theory on the other hand. So I'm, uh, I'm sure there will be uh, questions. Uh, I would like to start uh, the discussion with a, uh, with a comment, if I can. Um, I was really, um, um, I found it very interesting when you said that uh, the Piraha speakers um, said that you can say whatever you want because you're not a Piraha, right? right. And <laughs> this reveals a sort of uh, higher tolerance on their side uh, for how um, grammar can be dealt with by, by a foreigner, let's say. And mm -hmm. I was thinking that when we try to elicit data from um, people who have a relatively high um, metalinguistic awareness, usually you observe the opposite, namely people that say, oh no, you could never say that, but right. they actually do it, right? <laughs> so a lower degree of tolerance. Uh, so I was wondering um, how to deal with the with the presence, first of all, and the degree of metalinguistic awareness when eliciting data. That's a superb uh, question, and I have worked with different groups who have a much lower tolerance. You know, you could say that the uh, Pidaha are sort of the opposite of the French, uh, <laughs> who, who every time I try to ask a question when I'm in France, um, it takes a very tolerant person to admit they can understand anything that I'm saying. Uh, but the Pidaha would try their very best to understand and uh, um, uh, whereas other groups wouldn't. The Banawa that I've worked with are metalinguistically, a couple of them, quite sophisticated, and they know that I want to be corrected. Uh, when I was learning Portuguese, I would pay people from the neighborhood, young people, to come by and talk to me for an hour each. And I said, but you only get paid if you correct me. And so uh, uh, they, they would correct me they, and, and all the time. And um, so the only way around that for the Pidaha is to, um, but it, this is true everywhere. We can do questionnaires. Um, like I teach a course on uh, business culture since I teach at a business university. And I, you know, many businesses like to say that our culture is this or our culture is that, but do they really mean that? You know, so the only way to test it is to compare what they say with what they do. And um, that's the same thing with, with language. People might say they can do this. And, and the example you gave, you know, we can never say that, but in fact, they do say that is, is quite common. And so you need, that one's easier, right? Because if somebody says they can't say X, but in fact, they always say X, then you know that the, they do say X. There's no problem. If they say you can say X, but they never say X, that's a different kind of problem because that's an argument from negative data, which is always more difficult than an argument from positive data, but it's still in conversation and talking to people. And I did have one language teacher who was very patient and I would say, can you say this? And he would say, well, I don't think I would say that. And then, you know, so you could go from that conversation and, and, um, because if you said it and it was right, there was no question. Everybody would say pretty. You know, that's their way of saying grammatical, right? So uh, pretty. Uh, it's a pretty, you've made a pretty sentence. Um, but um, uh, so, yes, that's, a, that's quite a challenge. And these are the kinds of subtle challenges the field worker is constantly confronting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I see a question in the chat um, by uh, Priyeshi Kumari. Uh, may you please clarify one more time about last two levels of how to record conversations? Oh, um, let's see. That was, let, let me go to the, uh, I, I, everybody can see this but me, but let's, uh, um, How to record so conversation about the conversation i take it that 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 is it so yeah so so i record maybe two people talking and sometimes just one person because that's enough to get another conversation going on one recorder then i will call in two people and i will play this what i've recorded to them 
and ask them to talk about it. And they will both start talking, sometimes with each other, sometimes with me, but I'm getting, they, they quickly forget that I'm in the room. That's the purpose of it, right? Is to be talking about something and not simply responding to the linguist. I can also record that so that I have a conversation, I have a recorded conversation which you can hear one in the background and you can hear people talking about that one in the background. And I play this to two other people and they will talk about it too. You, you go through it slowly and you record these things and every level up, you, I mean, obviously at some point it becomes too confusing, but if you, if you go one to two levels up, you will find uh, interpretations. Interpretations are what you want to get because interpretations show different perspectives on the data and how to understand the data. So um, the real added value to to getting people to talk about conversations is to get their interpretations. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? I have another, I'm sorry, Dan, but I, I, I wrote down a lot of things. So um, what do you think about the basic linguistic theory um, Dixon uh, proposed to describe languages some times ago um, as a proposal to, uh, to have a theory neutral, somehow theory neutral uh, terminology to describe grammars? Because uh, you said, that we need theory as a window, right? To, to look at data, because if we have a wall, we cannot see through the wall, right? And Dixon's proposal was a sort of neutral window, but when it's neutral, is it theory? So what do you think about his proposal? Well, I know Bob really well, and he and I overlapped in the Amazon, and we ran a workshop together on field work for uh, uh, people working on a particular language family. And, um, I used to irritate him by saying, Bob, that's all theory. There's no such thing as neutral theory. It, you know, your his his view of S and O and A, this is all highly theoretical. He, it's not theory neutral. Um, I like the ideas that he has. I think he's an outstanding field researcher, um, a little bit abrasive, but we all are when we're in the field sometimes. But uh, uh, I, so I think he's a wonderful field researcher, and I respect him tremendously. Um, but I, but I own all three of those volumes of basic linguistic theory, or basically whatever he calls it. But it's theory; um, it's his theory of how to do language, and it's a good theory. So I don't, you know, I think people should should read it. Okay, thank you. So let's see if we have some raised hands. Yes, we did I see one? Yes, Jennifer. Yes, hi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I mean, it's very impressive, of course. It's like an adventure, linguistic as an adventure. So um, thanks a lot. My question is, in my corpus, I have um, different kind of data. So I also have conversations. I also have dialogues between different speakers. But uh, for me, it's like the, how can I say, the conversation is like the master discipline. So I wanted to ask if you think that you can um, get everything out of the conversations um, or if you would also accept uh, other kind of data. So what about, sometimes I can think like it's more easy to get what you are like trying to find. Like, what are you thinking about questionnaires? What are you thinking about uh, like, um, like just uh, like, you have one sentence in the present tense, you have one in the past, like how to translate it, like that it's it's really a hard way to, to work through the conversations and to do it with the translations if you're not so um, like already so far in language for understanding okay. everything yourself. So what are you thinking about other um, kinds um, of data, how useful they are? The field researcher needs needs to use everything they can possibly use. Yes. You know, you just 
Um, William Samarin, in his book, Field Linguistics, from more than 50 years ago, said that to criticize a field linguist for not having enough data is like criticizing a shipwrecked sailor because they didn't bring enough from the ship that sank when, when they get to shore. We have this brief opportunity, to, even if it's six months, two years, even if it's eight years, it's not that long given this lifespan of most people and what they're learning. So I use conversations to build paradigms. So I'll take a sentence out of the conversation and I'll try to form a paradigm with it and do elicitation. Yes. I use elicitation. I use questionnaires. I use experiments. I use conversations. Everything I can possibly, uh, you know, I invent sentences and then I test them out with the people and see how they, how they work. Um, uh, I called it uh, peripatetic, you know, walking around elicitation, ambulatory elicitation, uh, where everything, every day when I think I've learned something, I get up from my desk and I walk out into the village and I start trying to speak to people using this new thing I've learned. And um, uh, one time I, I, I got this long verb and I thought it meant um, that smells good. And so I walked up some, to some people and said it and they started laughing. And they, it turns out it means the smoke is very pleasant as it hits me in the nose right now. Uh, so it didn't mean any, it didn't mean what I thought it meant, but you only get this by testing it. So I would never say you can only use one kind of data, use everything you can get your hands on because it's a hard job. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Rodrigo, it's your turn. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to thank you very much. It was a wonderful, really a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you about this tension, right? Uh, you presented about the deep connection of language with different facets, like with culture, with cognition, with context, uh, how multifaceted is language and in terms of, for example, register uh, uh, um, genres, um, how can vary be, uh, be, um, in terms of different people or context of even uh, intra-speaker uh, variation. And this tension uh, in, in front of the limited span, uh, the limited uh, uh, time we have in, in, uh, in the field. So you, you already mentioned that, yeah, yeah that life is limited and field work is uh, finite so we don't we 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 will never be able to collect or to sample or to understand all, all, all kind of the phenomena we, we are facing so uh i think many of us already are facing this because first of all we have to choose what what kind of data we collect then what kind of data we already collected we, we are gonna transcribe because after hours and hours of recording we have we, we sometimes we are not able to trans to transcribe everything and then with our transcriptions what what part of the transcription we are going to annotate we are, we are going to put on the corpus or we are gonna etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh two questions <laughs> first um how could we face this tension and how could we decide um, what, what are, 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 are we gonna for first collect, register, um, annotate, etc. And second, I feel perhaps I'm, I'm wrong, but I feel many times that uh, traditionally some kind of data which is taken as like a free variation, let's say, um, if, for, for example, inter-speaker variation or intraspeaker variation, um, also in lexical meanings, if it's re related to women speaking or men speaking or in different contexts, in terms of identities, I feel that that kind of data is sometimes neglected, um, like um, taken as irrelevant because it's like just variation, it's like just noise. But as you have shown, uh, it it can be really important connections to grammar. So my second question is, uh, where do we 
top, like um, building a, 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 a descriptive grammar, because it it it, it, it can be very useful. Sorry, to add some of this variation and also in lexical meanings. And sometimes, at, at, or at first, we are not going to understand why this variation exists. But perhaps some years later. Uh, we ourselves or other people can understand that this variation is really not like noise, but importantly connected to some part of the culture or context. Well, I completely agree with that. It's, on the one hand, it's an extremely difficult problem. In fact, there's no solution to it. You're always going to leave things out. Um, second, yeah, I don't believe in free variation. I think that all of these things that happen, happen for a reason and that we call it free variation when we haven't figured out that reason. It's like the morphine that we find in most languages where the linguist translates it as emphasis. That just means we don't know what it means, right? You know, it just, it's just a word. Um, so, so we have to uh, test these kinds of things. I, I, but ultimately you have to be guided by what you're interested in. What do you know the most about? What, what is what is your passion? What are you interested in? And and that's what you're going to fo focus on. And that's a very natural thing to do. Um, don't try to do everything because you won't have time. One common field mistake is for people to bring back data from the field that they have not analyzed because they think they're going to have time to do it. No, you won't. If you don't analyze it in the field, you know, Peter Ladafoga told me a story when he was doing field re uh, research with Ian Madison in Africa. And the head man uh, uh, wanted to uh, tell Ian this long story in the language that he said he had never told anybody or, and it was a very important story. And they were getting ready to leave. They, they were only, you know, they were leaving within an hour or so. And, and Peter said, we didn't record it. I, I didn't want to record it because it wouldn't do me any good. I could never process it outside the village and I wasn't coming back to the village. So I just left it there. Um, did that mean that he was leaving a lot of information behind? Yeah, absolutely. He was leaving a lot of information behind, but we all do that and we can't, we can't do it otherwise. You know, it's like trying to memorize every song we like. Um, we like too many songs, you know, we can't, we can't figure them all out. Um, uh, I think that field research, if it were done ideally, would be done by teams of linguists, anthropologists, psychologists, and others, but that's also never going to happen. Um, the world doesn't, you know, maybe in one or two cases it will happen, but by and large, it's not going to happen. By and large, it's going to be the solitary, insecure field worker going to a place they've never been, intimidated, knowing they're never going to figure it all out, and coming back and telling the story as best they can. It's a very fragile business and I respect people who do it because it is the hardest thing I know about. Uh, I can't think of anything that's harder or more humbling. And so, um, uh, you know, we just do the best we can. Perfect, thank you very much. So I understand from your question that um, there is value, including, let's say, uh, the, a variation in a grammar, in a descriptive grammar, even if we don't understand if it has, what's the meaning? Uh, behind it. Yeah, it can lead to other questions. I mean, you can, you can, as long as you make it clear that you don't understand it, you know, like you have in your grammar, you can have a footnote and say, these people pronounce this differently, or they, they say this sentence in these different ways. I don't understand why. Um, somebody else might want to then go there and figure out why. Uh, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, you just be honest in the grammars. Don't pretend to know things that you don't understand, because you think that you know, people see something in black and white, they think, okay, that's true. But my view is that every grammar that's ever been written should be rewritten. How many grammars are there of English? How many grammars are there of Italian? Um, there should be more, you know, there's the Cambridge grammar of the English language written by my friend, Jeff Pullum. Uh, he would never say that's the final word on English, although it may be the best grammar of English ever written. Um, it is still not the final word. And, and by no means have I uttered the final word on Pita Ha. Uh, people say, do you think you could be wrong? Well, I don't think I could be wrong. I know I'm wrong about a lot of stuff. I mean, that's just the way grammar writing is. 
All we can do is be ready to defend what we've said. We have to have arguments, not just opinions for what we say. But other than that, um, we're just doing the best we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have three questions. Uh, so there is a question on the chat uh, that I would like to read. Uh, I'm sure I understand. No, sorry, it was before. Yeah. Um, by uh, a student of our school, Vanefo. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to read it actually. Um, Vanefo Chukwongo. When you say it would be ideal for linguists to first learn the language they intend to study, considering the time this might take, as well as the size of what they might want to do in the language, wouldn't this, to an extent, restrict the, ling uh, the linguist to that language alone? This is the question. Um, not necessarily. I mean, on the one hand, I don't think it's bad to do one grammar and no others. I mean, if it depends on how detailed that grammar is. I, we need grammars of these languages. So um, if they're made better by learning to speak the language, then one is better than two where you don't speak the language. On the other hand, I have published more than one grammar. So I did the small grammar of Pitaha, and then I did a large grammar of the Wadi language, which I do not speak, uh, but which my co-author speaks fluently. And, and so uh, to give you an example of this, uh, she gave me a certain set of sentences from her texts, uh, my co-author, that seemed very bizarre and I didn't believe them. So I went to the village myself. She stayed behind so I could test for myself. I went to the village and I got out these sentences and I read them to the people and they said, oh yeah, we don't talk like that. You can't say that. And they said, where did you get that sentence anyway? And I said, Barbara told me, oh, Barbara said it. Well, she speaks the language really well. So maybe, maybe you can say it. So they started thinking about it and they said, oh yeah, you can say that. You can say it only in this circumstance, uh, which was the circumstance she told me. So there's a good example of why speaking the language and having the respect of the people can lead them to think more deeply about uh, certain things. So it's hard, yeah. You know, I wouldn't say that you, if you can't speak the language and you've done the best you can and you wanna go somewhere else, well, it's a free world, so do what you wanna do. We're, I'm not talking about what I think the law should be. I'm just thinking about what, uh, for me, the ideal would be. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, I think now it's uh, Theodoros' turn because um, we have other questions in the chat, but they arrived later on. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, lecture. I would like your point of view on cutting data through description. I mean by, by showing a picture and ask for a description. You've already mentioned uh, uh, elicitation and so on, but I'm not quite sure about the description technique for adults, because every time I tried it, it looked um, from their point of view, a little bit childish. So um, um Yeah, picture elicitation is very difficult, even film. So the Max Planck and Nijmegen at least used to have some films on for doing elicitation. Um, but what you find when you play these films, because I've used them in, in a couple of different Amazonian communities, is that uh, European women do not dress like Amazonian women. And they Europeans have much less in their dress sexual dimorphism. So all the, all the Amazonians and all the villages I worked with could talk about, is this a woman or is this a man? Because this affected their view of things and on film, they can't tell the difference very often between a woman and a man if they're dressed the same. So um, uh, this was very distracting. I talked to an, I was using pictures of animals to elicit um, names for animals. And sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. And I talked to an ethnozoologist and he said, well, actually the proper method is to go in and map off or rope off a certain part of the jungle and to capture alive every single animal there, every, an example of every animal, and then bring that live animal to the village and ask them how to say it. Um, that's really hard, but it just points out that pictures are problematic. Uh, would I say never use pictures? No, but 
I, in fact, there's an entire paper that I've published with, um, with a couple of psychologists who went with me to the field showing that the Pita Haas cannot read or understand pictures uh, without a lot of help. Two-dimensional space, two-dimensional representation is um, common in Western cultures, but it's very uncommon in the real world, especially with Amazonians, Amazonians who don't read or write. So um, using a picture with those people is highly problematic because they don't even understand photographs, um, uh, many of them. So, and, and we've published on this with, with a number of experiments that show this. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, Chica, um, uh, Kennedy Ayede asks, um, I'm sure I understood what you meant by fieldwork should be biased by theory. But if it means having a theory in mind before going to fieldwork to aid analysis, does that not mean working towards an already established answer? Shouldn't it be the other way around? That is understanding data before a theory. I mean, that, that's again, that's a very good question. I would say that all of my early publications and many of my later publications are showing why I think certain theories are wrong. They're the theories that I went to the field with and because I had them in mind, it was fairly easy to show that they were wrong. Um, the first article that I ever published in, in a major theoretical journal was a, was a brief piece in the journal Linguistic Inquiry back in 1984, in which I argued that Pitaha syllable onsets were important for determining stress placement. This was considered impossible. I received postcards back before email from very famous uh, phonologists telling me this was not possible. Eventually, Peter Ladefogut came down to test this and he tested it and he said, oh, onsets are important. So we published that article in language and um, now people accept this conclusion. But I wouldn't, it wouldn't have occurred to me to publish on onsets if I didn't realize that one theory was predicting that they should be invisible to stress placement. And I had data that showed that they weren't. So it's knowing the theory helps you understand what is worth, what is noteworthy. You're looking, for, you know, you want to tell people what's unusual about this language, not just how it's like every other language. Um, and so the theory, as long as you're willing to contradict the theory and, and step out on a limb and say that this famous person who wrote this is wrong, um, um, you know, that, that's an important way that linguistic theory advances. Thank you, Dan. Uh, there's another question in the chat and then it's uh, Darius turn. So one more question from the chat before. Um, Hannah asks, uh, how do you deal with incomplete sentences in dialogues? In my recordings, I find there are some incomplete sentences when I play back to my consultant. Would you leave it what it's like or try to complete these sentences or delete these incomplete parts and why? Another, another very good question uh, driven by field work, obviously. Um, well, first, we don't know if it's incomplete unless we have a theory of how the language already works. Um, otherwise, we don't know if it's incomplete. Maybe, maybe we're wrong. You know, so, um, you know, but, you know, so in 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 Portuguese or Italian, you can utter a sentence without the subject, which you can't do in in English. You know, so, you know, you say in English it's raining, it is raining, and in Portuguese it's está chovendo. Um, well, is that está chovendo? Is that an incomplete sentence? from an English perspective it is, but not from a Portuguese perspective. So finding that in natural conversation leads me to, leads me to question the speaker more. Um, so making paradigms um, and, and seeing if people will accept that. If it is an incomplete sentence, just a false start, then you market it that. It can tell you things anyway. You know what, where did they break the sentence? Did they break it in the middle of a word? Probably not. They probably broke it at the end of a word and didn't continue. These things are common in all languages. And although they don't teach us, you know, they, they're not grammatical sentences, even ungrammatical sentences can teach us about the grammar by the way that they're uttered and, 
how the intonation ends. And there's all sorts of things you can learn from them without having to say their, their grammatical sentences. Okay, thank you. Darius. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, this is from experience. I'm wondering what um, the linguist can do when in the language community, you find out that there are already texts written on the language. So after collecting your data, um, when you realize that there isn't any standard orthography, what do you do? I, I, I'm saying this because I uh, encountered a situation where there are texts like the Bible and then some other materials on the language, but then there is so much inconsistencies in the kind of text that exists. So you as the linguist, when you start describing the language, preferably in the language that you want the people to understand, what do you do in such a situation? That, that is a superb question. There are villages in the Amazon, you know, for example, among the Shavanshi people of the Shingu Park, where Catholic missionaries developed one writing system and Protestant missionaries developed another writing system. And you would never want to use the Catholic writing system in a Protestant community or the Protestant writing system in a Catholic community. Unfortunately, that's a division that exists. Uh, the phonemic alphabet is a scientific uh, fact but the orthography is a political fact. And um, my, my view is that you write it phonemically. If, if you can use the phonemics, uh, which you probably can't, um, then do so. But otherwise I would talk it over with the community. The only solution to that is a community led decision where you tell them, I want to leave this so you can all read it, but I don't know whether I should write it like this or I should write it like that. What do you wanna tell me? And it may be that you have to adapt it for different communities. It probably won't be that difficult, but it, we run into this problem all the time. I mean, you know, English has one of the worst orthographies the world has ever seen. Um, and yet we don't change it because, you know, why does it take an English child, an English speaking child, uh, years to learn to read and write their language, whereas uh, the child who speaks who, who has an orthography that's closer to the phonemics can learn in a few weeks. Um, these are political decisions. Uh, so, so it's a very hard question, but it's not a purely, you know, it's a, it based on your relationship with the community. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have another question in the chat by Lilia. Uh, do you have any tips for how to learn the language? How do you get started? Are there any particular techniques you use? Uh, yes, actually, there is a um, longer than almost a two hour video of me doing exactly this on the internet uh, called Monolingual Fieldwork. It's by the Linguistic Society of America. It's a demonstration. I did to 500 American linguists at the Linguistic Society of America, where you don't speak any language in common. You walk into a room and you start learning the language. Um, so I start, you can watch the video, you might find that entertaining, but also I start with nouns and then I do things to nouns. So maybe I'll, I'll get a rock, things from nature, not artificial things. Um, they may not understand what something is that was made by my culture, but they will understand natural objects. So pick up a rock and you say in English rock um, and, or Italian uh, or Portuguese pedra, and then you ask them, what do you say in their language? And they will give you the word for that. Here's the interesting thing, you know, if, if you're aware of Willard Van Orman Quine's problem called the Gava Guy problem, he says, how could the field linguist ever know whether they're giving them the word for rock or the surface of the rock or a part of a bigger rock. You know, how do you know what they're saying? Well, the answer is you don't, but almost always humans will give you what you're asking for because as humans, we sort of understand if I say rock and point at this, oh, you're asking for my word for whatever you said. And, um, and then you can drop the rock and you say the rock fell and then they'll say the rock fell. Um, 
and and you start off slowly like this. This is how I started off with the Pita Hans, how I learned the language with no language in common. So there are, I have an article um, in a book that was edited by Paul Newman and Martha Ratliff um, called uh, Monolingual Fieldwork, in which I talk about these techniques. But there's also, there are two videos of me on the internet uh, doing this. So if you just look up Dan Everett, monolingual fieldwork, you'll see a whole video of me working. So the woman comes out, it turns out she was speaking. Um, um, now I can't remember the language. There was a whole, uh, Clint Eastwood made a whole movie about this community called Grand Torino. Anyway, um, uh, and I switched to Pita Ha and start speaking to her in Pita Ha. And so clearly she doesn't know what I'm saying. So then she starts telling me things and I start writing on the board what I think they mean. And then I start giving her sentences and um, it shows that this sort of thing works. It's harder for me these days because I no longer have any hearing in my right ear. You know, your body starts to fall apart when you get old. Uh, so I can't do these kinds of demonstrations, but I could hear well at that demonstration. So uh, I did that. Uh, thank you. Another question, Laura. Laura Volpato. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wonder, maybe this is a silly question, but I was wondering if you ever have um, a pre preferred way to note down gestures, if you have, apart from the sound of the conversation, if you have a way to note down what is super segmental. So, in a visual way, gestures, postures, and this kind of information. And another question is if you have a, if you have um, focused um, research on group uh, conversation. So not just two people interacting with each other, but instead group conversation. Another very good question. And uh, as as my equipment has improved from just pencil and paper to cassette recorder to reel to reel recorder to digital recorder, it also now includes video equipment. So um, I, I tend to video these conversations and these kinds of things nowadays um, and, and make notes of the gestures. Um, and when it comes to doing that, I work with people who specialize on it. I mean, I really, I really am not good at writing down gestures. So I record them and I look at them and I say, you know, what they're doing at the time if I have an opportunity to do that. But basically you film them and you work with somebody who knows about gestures. And it's like ethnomusicology. I, I mean, I'm interested in understanding Pitaha music better, but I'm not an ethnomusicologist. I, I'm a musician and I'm, we're all amateur musicians probably, but I, uh, I'm, I'm not specialized in, in that kind of work. So I, I video or, or even just tape the music and sit down with an ethnomusicologist and talk through it with them. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you could learn everything, yeah, it would be great to learn how to note down gestures and, and transcribe your videos. Um, but if you're part of a university and you have other people working there that could help you, then bringing these videos back, as long as you understand everything that's being said on the video, because they will need to know that to interact with you. Um, so that's what I that's what I do is video these things. OK, um, let's see. We have some more questions. Um, In the chat, uh, we can see, yes, there is a question. Uh, could you please share the self-training video and the monolingual field worker paper with us? Uh, is this video that was just linked, is that the one? Um, somebody just posted a link to a video. That might be it. I guess. Uh, it'll see linguistic. Uh, is it? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Linguistic the linguistic Society of America. Society of America. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So you can see that um, I am, uh, I will, uh, you know, if, if people want to see any papers, I can send them uh, to Katerina and, um, and, and um, she can distribute them or you can write me directly, you know, my email is easy to find. Um, so um, just email me and I'll send you uh, stuff uh, that I have. 
Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question, Ariba. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, so uh, my question is in reference to your reply to Jennifer's question. This might be a very silly question, but when you say that a linguist should be able to use all the methods in the field, would it not depend on the kind of data that is required? I mean, casual or not, I probably, probably I'm going back to lab ops work here, but uh, if a research is focused on getting a casual speech, wouldn't be using questionnaires not be an accurate option maybe? Uh, and I understand that even with social linguistic interviews, it's not, uh, necessary that you eradicate the observer's paradox and it's not necessary that that you will get casual speech but wouldn't the degree of a casualness decrease with having a questionnaire That's it. yes it would decrease you would get another register you would get um you would get a more you almost certainly to get a more formal kind of speech and less casual speech um so if you want to compare those that's a great way to do it if you're not interested in getting that additional data you know, but but my view is that uh, even if you're only interested in casual speech, collecting examples of non-casual speech, as long as you know that's what it is, can be helpful for you, because we only understand things. Um, well, we're helped very much in our understanding by comparative methods. So having data to compare one one register versus another can help you understand each register individually better. Is my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This discussion is great. So many questions, really, <laughs> addressing so many different topics. Um, there is one more question, which is not, uh, it, it's a sort of request. Uh, could you please get a copy? Could we please get a copy of your presentation? A student um, I can send you, I, I'm happy to send you a copy of the slides. Um, that's all I have of this presentation right now. Um, I, I do have a, you know, a book with Jeanette Sockel on linguistic field work published by Cambridge, but I'll send, um, I'll, I'll send uh, a copy of the slides from this presentation and it can be distributed or you can write me directly for a copy of the slides. I'm happy to share them with you. Hey, Jennifer, the mic, we cannot hear you. Thanks. Uh, if there are no other questions, I have another. <laughs> um, so I, but this is not really about the field work, it's about um, the Piraha. Um, like you said about this uh, whistle speech, I think it's very interesting. So you said that the women are not really using it. So I wanted to know, um, did you find out how they if they understand it or like how you get this kind of meta information if you you also said the women are not really speaking to foreigners so but they are speaking to you because you're trusted you know so how do yeah. you know you even would need other people <laughs> to find it out or they say we are normally not talking or that we are normally not whistling or like how how you get this yeah. kind of information about the it's language very, it's like, very hard it's very yes. hard. You know, it took me two years before a woman would answer me. Um, they would just ignore, very often turn and spit, um, you know, showing disgust that I would talk to them. So it was inappropriate. So I didn't talk to them. So I, I started getting the women to talk to me by telling jokes and then they would laugh. They would try not to laugh, but they would laugh. Um, and, uh, and so then they would answer, you know, they would say something. And, and so eventually they realized that I was a trustworthy guy. Uh, and so they they told me, as did the men, that women don't whistle. And one of the an interesting phenomenon is that many, many languages of the world have whistle speech, but in the vast majority, not all by any means, but in the vast majority, only men whistle. Um, and um, I really don't have an expert. Nobody, as far as I know, has an explanation for that fact. Um, but I've never heard a woman whistle. Um, the men say they don't whistle. Um, if I ask women to whistle when I, so I play them a tape of a man whistling and ask them, they can tell me what it means, but they won't whistle uh, back. They'll say that's, that's up high speech. They call whistle language up high, you know, so there's a metaphor for the frequency. Um, but they say, you know, uh, men talk like that. We don't talk like that. 
So, um, you know, that's how I know. But a lot of the stuff we do are arguments from silence. You know, we yes. we try very hard to get something and we can't get it. Uh, does that mean it doesn't exist? You know, if I take a picture of of the sky and there's a hawk in the sky and I say there's a hawk here, you'll probably believe me because I took a picture of it. If I take a picture of the sky and there's no hawk there and then, then I say there are no hawks around here, you may not believe me. You just think, well, he didn't get the picture of that hawk. So it's always harder to go from silence than it is from positive examples. Yes, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, Lilia. Um, hey, I was wondering uh, also about the, the whistle speech and the humming speech, uh, whether, um, how, how many uh, phonological contrasts are lost in that kind of speech as opposed to um, speaking with consonants and vowels? Are people able to communicate the same things or do they use it for, for other kinds of ideas? And, and sort of how, uh, how many more words would become a kind of the same way as opposed to with consonants and vowels basically what I'm asking. Well, again, a very good question. Uh, Pitaha has one of the smallest phonemic inventories in the world. If you're a man, you have eight consonants. If you're a woman, you have seven consonants. Both have three vowels, e, a, u, unsurprisingly. Um, and um, um, those don't do a lot of work. Even when they're speaking, there can be free variation supposedly between consonants. And so what happens here, you know, like I would ask them, how do you say the word for head? You know, point to my head and say head. And they would say, ah, ah, bye. And I would repeat it and I would say, ah, ah, bye. And they'd say, yep, ah, ah, bye. And I said, oh, so it's pa, pa, bye. Yeah, ka, ka, ka. Uh, so they would just, you know, so what are they doing here? It's because particular kinds of consonants just aren't that important because they can whistle it. So the most important thing for the pitaha are prosodies, length, stress, tone, intonation. And so there's no limit to what they can talk about. Um, and so they use consonants and vowels, but, but if I'm listening to a discourse, um, they'll use consonants and vowels throughout, but there will be times when they simply switch. You know, I can't, they're just like humming or, or making the tones and the prosody. Um, so, so that becomes um, that becomes a challenge. Um, so, so one of the things that I say is one reason they have so few consonants and vowels is because they don't need them with this rich prosody that they use and the and the cultural value of prosodies. So the culture values prosodies more highly than it values uh, consonants and vowels. I mean, there are many languages that are tonal that could do what the Pitaha do, but don't. And my answer to that is they value the consonants and vowels more than they value the, the prosodies for basic communication. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Uh, could you elaborate on the fact that women have uh, fewer consonants than men? Because that sounded very interesting. So. Yeah, where the men have um, S, the women have H most of the time. Uh, most, most women will only use H there. And where the men have H, the women also use H. So for a man to say manioc meal is agaisi with an S. For a woman, it will almost always be agaihi. The woman's pronunciation is also different. They have a more retracted consonants and the, and the walls at the back of the mouth, the pharyngeal walls seem to be slightly constricted. So it produces a more guttural sound and what that means is the women have a smaller articulatory space than the men um, which is a cultural fact um, so even looking at the phonetics you find culture everywhere what would happen if uh, a woman started started using the men's kind of pronunciation or would they ever do that in a role play situation or they might. Um, I know, um, you know, many of the Pinaha men are bisexual. I don't know if the women are too, because, you know, I mainly talk to the men, but one Pinaha man who is uh, gay and not merely, but they're all bisexual because everybody has to marry. It's an important part of the economy. But this guy is, uh, you know, he's, he's happily and openly gay. So he uses the woman's dialect, I've noticed. He talks like the women do. So, um, 
you know, and of course, all men learn from their mothers when they're baby, you know, when they're children learning, they learn the woman's dialect and then they switch to the men's dialect. Very interesting. Uh, Francesca. Thanks. Um, so then you mentioned ethic issues in your presentation. And at the very end of the school, we will have another plenary um, uh, on ethical issues in natural language processing. But I, I guess we could have had as well, you know, a plenary on ethical issues in, in field work. Right. I know this is a very general question, but if you if you wanted to share some commentary, some reflections on, on these big issues, ethic issues in field work. Well, you know, you know, you're an external uh, force and not always for good when you enter a community. Everything you do is changing the culture. The way you, you know, when do you go to bed? When you get up? This is all changing. You know, there, you're always introducing change. I always ask the Peter, or at least I used to, every time I went into the village, um, is it okay for me to come here again? Is it okay for me to be here? Um, you know, the Pinaha don't write, so you can never get signed authorization. You can videotape their authorization, but then I'm the only one who can translate it. So, uh, you know, how, how does anybody know that it means what I said it meant? I mean, there's a very, the, the only people whose opinion really matters to me is the Pitahas when it comes comes to that. Um, there are subjects they don't want to talk about, and I would like them to talk about them. Uh, some people will, you know, some people won't. You know, you're always finding um, situations like, you know, just something simple like body parts. Uh, so you want to know all the names of the body parts. How do you figure this out without embarrassing yourself or somebody else, you know? So I asked one guy, you know, how he said these words so he just brought up two little kids and pointed to everything on them and told me what it was <laughs> and that was fine so i figured out all the body parts but um um uh you know the body part names change when you've gone past puberty so the you know the sexual uh the genitalia change names when you when they're mature versus versus immature so you get that out of conversation um and um that, that's an example. Uh, how do you use the data? You know, I mean, can you use their data? Can you? So I had the worst case for me I ever had was with um, with a group in the Shingu Park. I had a very large grant, the largest grant I ever had. And I had a team, a really good team of people. And we were doing this field research. And one of the people in the group, the head man came up to me and said, we want you to buy us a new Mercedes Benz truck. We need a new truck. And I said, well, I don't have any money to do that. And they said, well, actually, we've been on the site of the British funding agency, and we know how much money you've got. And you could just fire these two people over here, and you could afford to buy us the truck. This is not something I expected to confront. So I wrote to the University of Manchester uh, in, you know, Ethics Board, Re Institutional Review Board, and they said, no, you can't buy them a truck, and you can't fire anybody. So they said, if you don't buy us the truck, you can't work here anymore. So that was the end of the project. Um, and I never have used the data. I mean, it was a huge amount of money expended to collect all this data, but because I made an agreement with them that I wouldn't use the data if they didn't want me to, never expecting they would not want me to, um, uh, that project was down uh, the tubes, it was gone. Um, uh, but it belongs to the community. You work for the community. You know, that, that's the thing. The linguist has to see themselves not as the, their own boss, but as an employee of the community to help them. You know, the community might not want you to work on the language that day. They may want you to take somebody to town or, or help somebody. We've done a lot of medical work. I've had basic medical training and we do this kind of thing. You're the closest thing to a doctor many people will discover, especially if you're in a really isolated place like the Amazon. I've had people come to me with, uh, you know, their whole leg split open by an ax and uh, they don't wanna talk to me about verb structure at that particular time. They want me to do something. So you have to do your best to sew it up. Um, so ethics it touches everything. There's just no way to work there without, you know, then I've had people from outside the community say, you're stealing their language. Um, well, actually they're still speaking it. So I don't understand in what sense I've stolen it. You know, they still have it. Um, but am I, you know, 
we do make money and we do make careers based on the data that we gather. So, you know, you can tell people, well, I'm not going to get paid for this, but actually you are going to get paid for it because that's your job you know, as your professor and you're getting promoted and all of this stuff. So you are getting paid for it. Um, it's, it's a very difficult, you know, Peter Latifog had made the decision. He worked, his first field experience, he worked for a prolonged period of time on one language in Africa. But in his later years where he was doing phonetic documentation, he would spend sh shorter periods of time working on languages around the world that he never intended to go back to. And that way avoided a lot of the ethical problems um, that long-term work does. And he said, that's one reason he did short-term work. He just couldn't deal with the ethical issues anymore. Um, so, you know, that's, that's another thing that makes field work so difficult and so challenging. That, you know, if, if I could just sit in a lab and do experiments all day, I mean, I don't denigrate, you know, people do that. That's wonderful. I'm really happy about it, but not nearly as hard as uh, field work. And it doesn't tell you as much about the world either. Um, so good, for, you know, my, my friend, um, Ted Gibson at MIT, who was actually my first PhD student, um, after visiting the Pitaha, decided that field work was telling him a whole bunch of stuff that he couldn't find in the lab. So now he does field work in Bolivia. Um, I mean, he's one of the only, he's probably the only person in the brain and cognitive sciences department of MIT that also does field work in South America. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think this is our last question. Claudia, Claudia Coppola. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I can. Hi, hello. So thank you for your talk. First of all, and uh, I'm sorry about wearing a mask, but I'm in a university building right now. So yeah. uh, I wanted to ask you, so what's your view on doing um, field work uh, in your own culture or, you know, with a closer culture? Well, I'm not interested in doing it, but that but a lot of people are. I mean, anthropology, if you, if you look at anthropology, it's moved from you know, Bronislaw Malinowski doing work with the Trobian Islanders to uh, most anthropologists, many anthropologists today study uh, US industry and US business. And I'm teaching a course on, on business culture and um, in America, you know, in the United States, my, my good, well, my, my uh, friend from many years ago, Greg Urban, who teaches anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania, he, he, he began his career and built his career on Amazonian languages, but today he's the editor of the Journal of Business Anthropology. So he studies US business. There's a lot to learn there, you know? So the fact that I'm not particularly, I'm interested in it because I teach on it, um, but I'm not interested in writing a book on it, maybe someday or, you know, but um, uh, there's a lot to learn there. So, I, you know, I wouldn't say that, it, I wouldn't say you shouldn't do it. I just say that, there's a lot to learn about the rest of the world. Um, so I would encourage people, especially linguists to go there. I would rather know about a language that nobody's ever documented before than another dialect of English. Um, but that's just me. And, and that's the great thing about research is the freedom to follow your interests. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, it wasn't the last question because the last question is on the chat. <laughs> I didn't see okay, it. Right, right. <laughs> uh, by Darius. Grammar is rather broad. To what extent can the linguist include every component of the grammatical hierarchy? Recent studies have shown that many core aspects have been, have been given little attention in previous studies, and these course pragmatic elements are gaining more attention more recently. So if a person had an unlimited lifetime and uh, all, the, all the opportunities they needed, then I would say that you need to describe everything, every, everything. But we have limited lifetimes and limited windows to do our research. So I would suggest starting with conversation, um, even if you're not gonna write anything about the conversation, look at the sentences in conversation. You may just want to, maybe all you wanna do, and I shouldn't say all, maybe what you want to do is to write a dissertation on information questions in language X. Okay, but 
you have to study more than the information questions to understand the information questions. So looking at how they're used in conversation and pragmatics. Um, my most recent paper uh, is coming out in a volume uh, from Cambridge on, uh, on human time understanding. And it's an article about temporal uh, understanding in Pitaha, even though they don't mark tenses. So how do you, how do you understand things temporally without tenses? Uh, that's where you you mention in the question discourse pragmatic elements. Um, um, I couldn't figure that out unless I had conversations. So you can only write up a certain amount of things. You can only study a certain amount of things. But if you ignore the grammatical hierarchy, if you simply focus on morphemes without ever looking at a word, or you simply work on words without ever looking at a phrase, your understanding of morphemes and words will be diminished. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Okay, I guess that was really, really the last, <laughs> the last question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see any more, any more hands or... or or um, yeah, messages. So yeah. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to everyone actually for the last couple of hours it was so interesting. Uh, thank you then once more for your inspirational talk. But thank you also to all the participants because they really contributed to you know to uh, making this uh, afternoon very interesting and inspirational. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. Uh, I think we are um, we're well equipped now. For, uh, for tomorrow, because tomorrow we will stay uh, again in fieldwork, in uh, language docu documentation. We will go more into the technical stuff, let's say, of, of spoken data collection, of um, uh, corpus based syntactic typology with uh, Frank Seifert and Jeffrey Haig. So we will have a lot to learn uh, um, about this fascinating field. So um, we will meet again tomorrow at nine o'clock uh, Bologna time, uh, the general link of the workshop. And thank you so much then again. Uh, really, thank you. really, really nice to have you here. Thank you all. Physically, but you know, virtually next yeah. time in presence. Yes, I look forward to that. Okay. Yeah, that would be fun. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye.